Voters across the country are headed to the polls today as Donald Trump eyes a possible Super Tuesday sweep to all but clinch the Republican presidential nomination. Trump could end up winning more primaries and caucuses than any previous Republican presidential candidate who wasn't an incumbent. It's an indication that he is successfully transforming the GOP. CNN senior political analyst and Atlantic senior editor Ron Brownstein is joining us right now. Ron, you just wrote an excellent article for CNN.com. As we watch voters head to the polls today, how do you see Trump's grip fundamentally changing the GOP? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think the primaries so far have sent us a important dual message about the state of the Republican coalition. As you say, the clearest message is that this is Donald Trump's party. His coalition is the largest faction in the GOP. And if you look at the way elected officials are behaving, especially the younger ones elected since Trump's emergence, uh, <clears throat> it's likely that he is going to be the dominant figure in this party for a while. Uh, for example, uh, virtually all of the Republican senators elected since 2018 voted against the aid to Ukraine, a rejection of kind of the Reagan era view uh, about America's role in the world symbolized by Mitch McConnell, who is stepping aside. But having said that, what the primaries are also showing is that there is a meaningful slice of the GOP coalition that remains resistant to this vision. A quarter, a third, maybe higher in some states where Nikki Haley has had the time and money to campaign. But there is a portion of Republicans who are uneasy about this, uh, who feel disconnected from it. And the question remains whether uh, Biden can harvest any of that into support for himself uh, in November, given their doubts about him as well. In your important article, Ron, you also write this, and I'm quoting you now, in important ways, Trump is a different candidate than he was yeah. in 2016. This time, he's much stronger among and more reliant on the party's most conservative elements. What does that mean, heading toward a general election in November? Yeah, he's more ideologically defined in the primaries than he was last time. In 2016, there really wasn't much difference in his support between moderates, somewhat conservative and very conservative voters. There wasn't much difference between voters who were not evangelicals and those who were. Now those gaps are much bigger. Trump is much more reliant on evangelical voters, uh, much stronger among very conservative voters. And the biggest divide that we saw in 2016, which was education, is even bigger this time. Trump's support among non-college Republicans is overwhelming. I mean, around 70 percent so far in most of these states. But among college-educated voters, he is still facing much more resistance. And that really is, as I say, Nikki Haley is leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for Joe Biden about where he can go. It's the same kind of voters that we saw in 2018, 2020, and 2022 reject uh, Republicans and move toward the Democrats. Why Biden became the first Democrat since Harry Truman in 1948 to win Maricopa County and in, uh, in Phoenix. Uh, suburban white collar voters. The difference, of course, is now these voters have had a four year uh, exposure to Biden and his record, and they are very negative on him. So how these double negative voters, these Republican leaning voters in many cases, uh, white collar voters who are down on Trump, but also down on Biden, how they sort out is obviously going to be critical in November. As you know, we could see Trump all but clinch the presidential nomination on the Republican side later today. But the question of what will happen to Nikki Haley's voters in a general election certainly remains. Yeah. What do you think happens? Well, look, at least 60 percent of her voters in each of the first three states, Iowa, New Hampshire and South Carolina, said in the AP vote cast study they would not vote for Trump in a general election. Eighty percent of them in our exit polls for Edison Research say that he is not, at least in each state that he is not fit to be president uh, if um, he's convicted of a crime. Now, I, I do, have not met a strategist in either party who believe nearly that many of them in the end would abandon uh, Trump. Uh, but if even a meaningful slice do, that becomes a problem. And as I said, the question is, the problem, the challenge for Biden is that many of those voters are negative on his performance as well. Uh, they like the economy better under Trump. And he really has to focus their choice on the issues where they have the most hesitation about Trump. The idea that he is a threat to their rights on issues like abortion, to their values, and to democracy itself. Of course, Biden faces, Wolf, as you know, the reverse problem which is that he is looking at historic defection at this point 
among black and Hispanic voters. Uh, Trump is, uh, in the polling that's come out this weekend, double, I think, the share that any Republican has had among black voters, and he's in the 40s among Hispanics. Whether Trump can sustain that all the way to November is a question, but there's no doubt that both coalitions now are showing some fractures. I want to talk about all of this with my great panel on the Super Tuesday, the Washington Post's Isaac Arnsdorf, Margaret Tollif of Axios, and Bloomberg's Mario Parker. I don't know, Margaret, when we were coming on air, she said, does it feel like Super Tuesday? I I'm gonna actually now, after listening to them, I'm gonna go with yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was does. touch and go for yeah. a while. <laughs> What are, your, uh, what are you looking for today, Margaret? Well, I mean, look, we all know where the numbers are going. Even if Donald Trump doesn't hit those numbers tonight, he's on a path that it, it seems irreversible. Um, a few things I'm watching for, obviously, in Virginia, those results are going to be important. They're going to tell us quite a bit about how college-educated suburban and exurban voters in around metro areas mm -hmm. uh, feel about the fall lines in this race and whether they can stomach another uh, Trump term or whether they really want an alternative. So that will give us some clues. North Carolina is similar. Yes, North Carolina is interesting for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, Democrats hoped it would be the most battlegroundy of Trump states. Uh, it, I'm not sure it's tracking that way, but uh, the governor's race is going to be uh, very interesting, especially if the current lieutenant governor becomes the Republican nominee for governor. So we'll be watching that contest. And then, of course, in the California uh, Senate race, I think that's the other race we'll be watching, yeah. you know, uh, on the Democratic side. Oh, yeah. no, that's that's a fascinating one for sure. Um, Isaac, you are on the campaign trail with Donald Trump a lot, exclusively maybe. Um, so I want to ask about some of the things that Kristen was touching on about how the Trump campaign is looking not just at what the results tonight tell them, uh, but also kind of big picture, assuming that he is the nominee, how he gets some of the, the Nikki Haley voters back. And the New York Times poll over the weekend told us a, a lot of interesting things about the national snapshot right now. One of them, everyone focused on, on Biden and what it said about Biden, but there's a lot in here about Donald Trump as well. Uh, question is uh, whether or not Republican primary voters, how they feel about Donald Trump being the nominee. 48% enthusiastic, 32% satisfied, but 18% are either dissatisfied or angry. So if you look at that and against that backdrop, listen to what uh, Donald Trump said about people who aren't quote unquote MAGA. He, he said it over the weekend in Virginia. I'm lucky that I'm able to explain it to the public, because if you weren't able to explain it, the public wouldn't know. They'd believe what they see. So I don't want to win this way. Look, I want to win based on my policies are better. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to get interest rates down. They say, always trying to demean, well, MAGA really uh, represents 48 percent of the Republican Party. No, it represents 96 percent and maybe 100 percent. We're getting rid of the Romneys of the world. We want to get Romneys and those out. The Romneys of the world still exist, and um, they're going to be put in a position of having to choose from three uh, choices. Trump? Biden, I mean, I guess there are others if they live in a state where there's an independent on the ballot, or stay home. What are you hearing from people in the Trump camp about statements like that from their candidate? Well, and that's really the argument that Nikki Haley is making, is that, that she is representing a significant constituency here that is not going to go away. But he's not exactly courting them with those statements. <laughs> well, he's... <sighs> You know, if you look back to New Hampshire when it was all about, it was supposed to be his night and he was so mad about what Haley did that it was all about her versus um, Michigan when he came out and he didn't mention Haley at all. Uh, and, and so they've been trying to uh, look ahead to the general, focus on Biden, just ignore Haley, make her go away. And But you're not seeing a ton of short of maybe letting off the attacks on Haley, you're not seeing a ton of, of outreach toward the voters who Haley is speaking to and, th and those voters who you heard Haley talking about energizing her to want to stay in the race. And yeah, to Isaac's point, I mean, I think if you look at uh, one of the questions right now is what does Haley do from here, right? She doesn't have the delegate math to go forward, et cetera. But if you look really closely, what she is doing is, to your point, Donna, creating some leverage, right? Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, the art of the deal, et cetera. Bringing that to the table, we know that he's, he's bleeding support in the suburbs among independents, et cetera. He's going to need the full coalition of the Republican Party in November. 
no matter whether she has 15% of that slice, 10% of that slice, when she could go to the table at Mar-a-Lago and say, hey, I, I may or may not endorse you, what can you give me in return? 